Welcome, Southside Bible Church, and any visitors, we are grateful to have you here with us to worship the, our God together. Um, as we begin, I just wanted to, I think I'll save that for next week. I was going to share philosophy about children in the service and how we're all working together, and next week when I got everybody back, we will look at that. So let's just go, uh, turn to Romans chapter 8. That's where we're studying as a church and this morning, we're going to open it up again, but let's ask God to meet us in the time of worship through His Word. Father, I thank You that You've given us an inspired Word. I thank You that what we hold here this morning are the words of God. And so we gather, God. We want to worship You. We want to hear from You. We want the Spirit of God to teach us. We want to understand the truths that are in here so we can know and behold our God and love Him and worship and follow and obey Him. And so God, would you do that in our midst? Reveal truths that will set your prisoners free, that will encourage believers who are downtrodden. God, the truths we look at this morning, I pray, use for your glory and your name's sake, we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 8, this is a great chapter on eternal security for the one who's been joined to Jesus Christ. The chapter begins in verse 1, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of what Christ has done for us. The chapter ends that there's no separation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And what is in between those are the reasons why Paul could make such dogmatic statements. And so we're journeying in detail to look to enhance our confidence in no condemnation and that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The first argument that we've been taking up is in verses 5 through 11. And it's building on what's called a henna clause, the, the purpose for why Jesus was condemned in the flesh in verse 3 for our sins and verse 4 for this purpose that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And so that now this essence of the law, that the very core was always to love God and to love others. And this gospel now sets us free from the bondage of sin to where now we truly can love God and love other people. Sovereign grace never leads to licentiousness, apathy, lukewarmness. Now we are the ones who are fulfilling the law of Christ as we are those who love God and love other people. And that is how we know that there is no condemnation and how we know that we are according to the Spirit. And verse 4, for those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, we have been set free and we are no longer according to the flesh of what we were in Adam, where flesh ruled and reigned. Everything we thought was earthy. It was life as if there was no God. And it was all for the here and now. We were all born from Adam according to the flesh. We were bound to it, stuck in it and under its condemnation. And by the work of Jesus Christ and the spirit applying that, we are now set free, saved, justified, and we are according to the spirit. We now have the Spirit of God ruling and reigning in our lives. And he told us last time we were together that, that when we're according to the flesh, it says that the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. You're, you're at enmity with God. You don't love Him. And it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. We can never bring our hearts joyfully and willfully under God. And Paul said, those then who are in the flesh cannot please God. You'll never, your good works will never be a pleasing aroma to God. They will always be a stench. They will be selfish and they will be rebellion to him. When you are according to flesh, you're under condemnation and you're locked in there and you cannot please your God. But we are those who are according to the spirit. And we're going to begin to take that up then this morning in verses nine through 11, where Paul will now flush out those who are according to the Spirit are those who have life and peace. Look with me in verse 9. <clears throat> However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And I, I just spent all week meditating and loving that, how beautiful that is. We looked last week for those who are in the flesh and the burden and the bondage and the slavery. And it's just an awful condition that it's called death and it ends in eternal death. It's a place of condemnation. And I want you just to hear this word, however. However, 
You are not. And Paul now switches from the third person to the second person plural. His readers now, he turns to them. And those are the ones at the beginning of this letter. He says, those who are loved by God in Rome. To those who are Christians. And so here's what it is to be according to the flesh. But now I turn to the church, to the brethren, to the believers, Christians. And we just really don't have a good way of capturing this in the English. I think Southerners do the best job of translating this when they say, you all. And that's what this is, is you all. You're not according to the flesh. The one who sits here that has faith in Jesus Christ, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. The miracle of grace has happened in your hearts. That's why you have faith in Jesus Christ. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to them. But for us, they're the power of God for salvation. The Spirit of God has worked and opened our eyes and shown us this. And so for you this morning, child of God, what I'm going to go over, these are the realities for you right now in their pure gold. And I wanted to lift your heart this morning for wherever you're at. Come with me and let the Spirit of God reveal to your hearts what is yours in Christ Jesus. And the grace of God, as I see it in a mirror dimly, But what I see is so beautiful, and I want you to stare your eyes out this morning at something so lovely. Here's our outline. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11 this morning. Paul's going to show us six realities of the one who is a Christian, the one who has faith in Christ, the one who has been justified, declared not guilty before God. First, you are in the Spirit. The Spirit is in you. You belong to Christ. Your body is dead. Your spirit is alive to God. You will experience a glorious resurrection is where we're going to close out this morning. So I just want to pray one more time. Father, what we look at is is altogether lovely. And I pray by your spirit that every child of God in here's heart would be overwhelmed with what verse 11 is going to tell us this morning. And so God, would you meet us and teach us excellent things from your word? Amen. First point, you are in the Spirit, Romans 8, verse 9. However, you are not in the Spirit, in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Paul's turning back now to the positive. We're not those who are governed by our fallen nature any longer. Jesus prayed this, I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you, said Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, you are not in the flesh. Your tyranny has been broken. Your active and willful rebellion to God, that dominion has been broken. And now you're in the spirit. You're in a whole new realm, a whole new territory, a whole new jurisdiction. You're under the control and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You have a new sway, a new control. And so as a Christian, you can never go back to being in the flesh. You can never go back to that realm where you were just according to the flesh and it ruled and reigned you. You can't go back there. You can't act fleshly. You can act carnal. But you can never again go back to that jurisdiction of being in the flesh. We are no longer in that state. We are in a new realm where the Spirit controls and He leads us. His dominion. And so being a Christian is going from being controlled and dominated by your flesh to the Spirit. We now have the mindset of the Spirit and not of the flesh. And that is why Jesus said, you must be born again or you'll never enter the kingdom of God. You must go from the realm of flesh to the realm of the Spirit, now teaching and leading and guiding us in the things of God. You're going to have many competitors as you're in the Spirit. You have the world, the flesh, and the devil that will fight against you daily. There are many battles that will be fought with these competitors, and you may act fleshly at times. But I just want you to hear this, child of God. You are in the Spirit, and His power, uh, it doesn't come from without 
It's not like the Ten Commandments. Go live this way. Uh, Christianity is now the Spirit will come in and from the inside with new uh, desires and all these things, He will lead us. He could have just stayed and barked commands from us from outside. But the new covenant is the way that God brings us under His sway. As He moves inside of you and He takes up residence. And He works from the inside to the outside. That's new covenant. And He changes your minds, your hearts, your desires, your hopes, your pursuits, your joys. Now the Spirit controls you and He leads you and He guides you. Freedom this 4th of July for the Christian is to do what you, you want to do for the first time you can do it, to do what you should want because the Spirit of God has come within us. So the first point as a Christian, you are in the Spirit. Second point, I want you to see that Paul says the Spirit is in you. If indeed the Spirit of God, he says, dwells in you, and so I just want to give you a little Greek lesson this morning because it's important to this text. In these three verses, there's what's called a condition of reality, and it's used three times in these three verses, and the way we translate it is if. And this condition, what it does is it, it assumes that the condition that's being talked about is a reality, and it's translated since or seeing that. And so a good translation is this, since, as indeed the case seeing that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. It's, it's, it's just a beautiful if. This if, it's not a doubtful if. It's the condition that every child of God finds yourself here this morning. The Spirit of God is dwelling in you. You're not in the flesh, but the Spirit of God is in us. This is a powerful nuance that Paul is bringing up here to make his point. So powerful that Martin Lloyd-Jones says it's the highest peak of the Christian doctrine of salvation. What would cause a godly man to say something like that? Well, because we house the Holy Spirit of God. And the Greek word here is the word for dwells. It's oikeo. And, and it's where we get the word oikos, which oikos means house. Oikeo means to live in a house. It means to take up residence. And so I want you to see it's not a hotel. It's not a bus station. It's not a building. It's, not, it's a residence and the glory of the new covenant is that the Spirit of God now dwells within us. And I want you to hear this. He makes his abode within us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? And the Septuagint, this translation, they use the same Greek word here for the Holy of Holies, the place where the Spirit, the presence of God dwelt that reverential, fearful center of worship. The Holy Spirit of God now fills us. That's awesome. And I just want you to think about this for a second this morning. That Jesus, God himself, came down. Eternity stepped into time. And what did he take on? He took on our flesh. Incarnation. He was incarnated in a human body, one of the greatest condescensions ever known to man. But that body that he took on was holy and undefiled. It was without sin and corruption. He, he, he incarnated himself into a sinless body by the Spirit. But I want you to hear this. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, he, he takes up residence not in holy humanity. He comes into defiled and soiled humanity and comes into us. He took up residence in our bodies to begin the work of purification, transformation, change, to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. He came in to us. Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my spirit within you, says God, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. That's what we're learning from the inside to the out, to love God and love others so that you might be careful to observe my ordinances. The glorious fulfillment of that promise is that God himself, holy God, has taken up residence within us. And it brings tears to my eyes every Christmas as I contemplate the Son of God laying in a manger in a donkey's dish. But the Holy Spirit taking up residence in something far worse than a stinking manger, me, he dwells in you. A permanent settlement. He doesn't come as a guest. 
It's not a temporary residence, it's permanent. He has made us his home, not his hotel. The Old Testament, he, he came in and you did works and he left. The promise of this new covenant, I'm going to come right in and I'm going to take up residence and dwell within you. I mean, the whole thing is from the Holy Spirit dwelling. He doesn't come to loiter. He comes to dwell, to lead, to rule, to influence, to transform and change us. And this is for free. But in this one verse, in verse 9, kind of overwhelming here as we look at this, it says the Spirit, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, all in one verse. Which is it, Paul? I'm going to read to you John 14 again. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus says, I will come to you. Jesus comes to us in the Holy Spirit and, in, and there's adoption. The Father comes to us to make their abode with us through the Spirit of God. The whole Trinity is dwelling within us. How do our minds and our hearts not blow up with this stuff? Jesus said in John 14, 27, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And this is done through the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. Paul's point is this. This is the only thing that can get you out of being in the flesh. We already saw that when you were under the law, the law came and it just stirred up flesh and made more sin. Christ said flesh can only produce flesh. The spirit regenerates and he makes us spiritual and he puts us in the spirit and he comes to abide in us. And Paul says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. He says in this verse, he does not belong to him. You're still in the flesh if you're not in the Spirit. And this destroys so many false views of sanctification that I can be a carnal Christian. I'm just not spiritual yet. No, you have the Spirit in you. I, I get saved and I get the Holy Spirit later. Right now, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, he says you're not a Christian. I get a second blessing later. I get all the blessings right now, the Holy Spirit of God within me. You just can't say it any clearer. If you're saved, you have the Spirit. You're in the Spirit and if you don't have the Spirit, you're in the flesh, and that's what rules you and drives your life. Everything is according to flesh and the scene and what I can get now. You're, you're in that bondage, and there's a way to be born again, to be in the Spirit. Third point, you belong to Christ. Romans 8, 9, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. To possess the Spirit is to possess Christ. And Christ comes and he pays a ransom price. In Romans 3, we spent months on what Christ did on the cross, and he paid that ransom. And he's removed the enmity between you and God so that now you have peace you're adopted into the family of God, and we belong to Jesus now, whoever lives to make intercession for us. I am his and he is mine, and that we might die to the law, he said, so you could be joined to another, married to Jesus. We belong to Christ. And Jesus said, it's better that I go away. I need to go away so I can send the helper, the Holy Spirit. How could it be better that Jesus goes away? Because the only thing better than Christ outside is Christ inside. And this Christianity is to be one with Christ. And the Spirit unites you to be one with Him. I'll take that any day than Jesus walking around on this earth. I, I got Him in my heart. Comes in and takes up residence within us. You belong to Christ. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, though the body is dead, Christ is in you. Another first class condition since Christ is in you, the Spirit is in you, and therefore Christ is in you, mediated through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And now I want to look at kind of a strange part to this verse. And the fourth point is your body's dead. Your body's dead. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead <coughs> because of sin, 
If Christ is in you, you're, you're alive, you, you've been redeemed, you're joined to him, but your body is dead. Your body's dead because of sin. And so what does this mean that the body's dead? Does this talk, this is in, in Romans 6.11, reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. This isn't, that isn't what Paul's talking about here. He doesn't use the term sarks, which is what he's been using through Romans 7, is our sinful flesh. But here the term just for our, our, our human bodies. This is what we've been seeing through Romans, to, to give our human bodies now to, as instruments to God to serve him. And so he's saying uh, in verse 11, there's going to be a physical resurrection of our literal bodies. And so because of sin... Romans 5, 12, uh, uh, Adam sinned and death, death spread to all men. Sin entered the world and now death goes. It's, it's the only explanation for death. Sin entered the world and now death entered the world. And I see this then as the state of condemnation then because of sin. And the, and the seat of death is in every one of our bodies because of Adam. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it's the principle of decay and death in all of our bodies. That's what's dead. At birth, we begin to die because of the fall in Adam. Every one of our bodies are going to deteriorate and give out. Douglas Moo says it, it has what's called a concessive thrust that would say, although the body is subject to death because of sin. So because of Adam and sin, our bodies are going to die. And I can't tell you how important this is. Because American Christianity has become about the here and now. Like Christianity is just, how can I get a better life now? All I want is, is Christianity for my, my life today. That's all I'm about. That's, Christianity's lost its end goal in America. We don't like to talk about death. And we certainly don't like to think about it. What do we do in America? We dress it up. We put makeup and tuxes. We try to make the curse look beautiful, and we do everything we can to try and keep it out of our minds. Ooh, I can't hear you. We have a billion-dollar industry to try to fight it and deny it. Hebrews says the fear of death held us all in bondage all of our days. But since the garden, death has spread to all men, and so all men will die. And what I have seen is that the gospel that overcomes the grave is not what people want or think about enough in the church. We want to get it out of our minds. And, and when death comes, I unfortunately have seen this too many times, you can't change the channel. It won't listen to us. It's certain, but it's the least thing that most people are prepared for. Because we're according to the flesh, all we want is the here and now. I just want some religion that will help my here and now. And I don't want to think about this. I don't want to talk about this, Pastor. You are making me uncomfortable. And so what happens is that when death comes, we think it means that God is against us. There's something wrong here. I'm a Christian. I live forever. What's going on with my body? How could this come to me, child of God? I've seen some of the most righteous people tormented in their deaths. Awful deaths because the body's dead because of sin. And we have the old age in us from Adam, but we got the new age inside of us of the Holy Spirit of God taking up residence. And so here's what I want you to hear. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. They're gone as far as the east is from the west. Sin is no longer your master. Spirit dwells within us. We have a future glory that is beyond belief or hope. Yet death remains on our human frame. And our death is not a punishment from God or even a penalty. Our death is the result and effect of sin and the sin of Adam that has come into every human. Our death does not occur because God is our enemy, child of God. Do you hear that? The outer man is decaying, and it's a process, and it's not a punishment. We will die like all men, but our death will not be like other men. And I want you to get that in your heads, because as, as a shepherd, you got to get this. Your fifth point. Happy Fourth of July, right? <laughs> it doesn't end there. 
Praise God. Yeah, right, brother? (laughs) Your spirit is alive to God. Yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. More little, little Greek is, yet the spirit is life because of righteousness. And there's a debate then, is, is it your human spirit or the Holy Spirit? A lot of stuff written on that. And I'm, gonna, I'm leaning towards this is the Holy Spirit. Because in the Greek, it doesn't have a, a small S or a capital S. You, you, the context has to determine it. And the context before and after is Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And I think it draws out what Paul is saying here the best. We, we need more evidence in my mind to depart from the Holy Spirit. And I think what he's saying then is the body's dead, but the Spirit, he's life. He gives life because of righteousness. We've been studying this for two years. What kind of righteousness? The righteousness that Jesus Christ came and obeyed this law perfectly. Every jot and tittle. And now God will put that to your account. As you sit here this morning, that righteousness can be put to your account by faith. It's Romans 5 all over again. Adam brought sin and that brought about death to all men. The second Adam came and obeyed perfectly and he brought righteousness and it brought life. Paul's just adding and following on with that. The Holy Spirit is not life apart from the accomplishment of the redemption by Jesus Christ. That's where life comes from, by righteousness being put to your account. That's how the Spirit gives life. This is the life that overcomes death. The fact of God's indwelling me means that I have life and the righteousness of God. So don't get duped by decay and by sin and struggle and dying. Don't get duped by it. The body's dead because of sin. But what's inside has been made alive because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have indestructible life within you. And this life will win. It will give you eternal life. And when you look at your body, though it's dying, it's it's gonna preach something different. And I've gotta preach this again and again through the word of God to my heart and to my soul. It will give life because of his righteousness. Christ, we're clothed in death but indwelt with life. God saves you in stages. And so he he justifies you when you have faith and he makes you right with him. And he grows you by the spirit now having control. And then on the last day, he's going to set you free from all this last curse of death in this fallen world. And we're going to enter into the glory of what God has prepared for us. So all of this, Sets up the crescendo. Have you ever watched fireworks? I don't know why I'm bringing it up. But I, it really is. And the, the, the fireworks, as a little kid, what I used to like about them was the end. And at the end is what we call the crescendo. And that's when all of them would just go off and you're like, yeah. And you're screaming as a little kid. And that's what I think Paul is about to do here in verse 11. I'm just going to call it the crescendo. So the six point resurrection, life, look with me. This is going to take your breath away. Verse 11, but if, first class condition, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Condition of reality, since that same spirit that dwelled in Christ dwells in you, Let me just do it slowly. But if the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of Him, the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He, the Father, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through resurrection, through His Spirit who indwells you. Jesus hung on a cross in my place. And he bled and he died for my sin. And he was taken down and he was buried in a grave. And on the third day, some of the apostles and some women came to the grave. And the stone is 
rolled away. Throw that up there for me, whoever's back there. This picture overwhelmed me. And the angel says, he's risen, just as he said. I have no doubt that tomb is empty. And he now seats at the right hand of God because I know him and he saved me. There's no doubt that that spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Do not miss what Paul is saying here. You, child of God, have that same spirit within you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And in the same way that he gave life to Jesus' dead body, it's the same day when that trumpet sounds on the last day, he's going to give life to your mortal body. And we'll say, we have risen, just as he said, amen? So what I think Paul's going after is this. I still battle sin in my body. And I still act fleshy at times, and I see death in my body. We have cancers in our midst, and diseases, and weakness, and decay. And the enemy beats me for it, and he casts all kinds of fears upon me in this battle to glory. How could someone like this be loved by God and be saved to the end, is my question some days. How can I be certain that with this body, that I'm going to be delivered ultimately. Everything seen just seems to preach against this. And so Sherry Hoover, if you're listening this morning at home in hospice, don't listen to the lie. The body's going to die. Kissman family, your sweet mom and grandmother and Wood family, it just, it just, it's, it's decaying. The body's decaying, like it said from Adam. But what's inside of her is going to live. And on that trumpet sounds, their bodies are going to be raised and perishable forever. Is there a guarantee of this? The Spirit of God dwells within me. He says it in verse 9, and he says it in verse 11. It's just bookended. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within believers. There's an absolute guarantee of my final redemption. Paul said, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given to you as an engagement ring or a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. You have an engagement ring of God's promise to bring you to the marriage supper of the Lamb and to be resurrected and be there and celebrate with Him forever. And God does not break promises. And the Spirit of God is my engagement ring. And I'm going to be raised. I'm going to be raised. And Paul says, we, we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. These dying things, we're waiting for it. And in the meantime, we are in these tabernacles and we groan and we're burdened and we have the seed of death in us. This is the body of my humiliation. But when Jesus comes, the same spirit will raise me into the body of my glorification. Throw up uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 42. I went out of order, so if you don't have it, Brian joyfully already read these, so I, I might not need to. So also in, is the resurrection of the dead it is sown a perishable body into the ground and it's going to be raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonor and it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness and it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I want to read it again. Behold, I tell you a mystery that we're not going to all sleep, but we shall all be changed and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on, uh, put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death swallowed up in victory, and he'll later say, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? 
our bodies are going to be glorified. What a section. To be in the Spirit, there's no condemnation. To have the Spirit, and this is where he's driving this whole thing, is now I can keep the requirement of the law. When I can finally be set free from the fear of death, that I have the Spirit and he's going to raise me the same way he raised Jesus, when, when I can be free of that, I'm free to be radical and give my life away to love God and love other people. This whole thing is how to keep the requirement of the law. And when you look at what we just looked at, what should scream from every heart is freedom. I'm free now to serve God and love him and love other people. And then in verses 12 through 13, the spirit will put to death the deeds of the flesh that remain in us. And in verse 11, he will raise this mortal body from the grave and I will put on mortality. I pray if you would like to be done with the fear of death, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And it's, it's certain, it's an engagement ring promise that he will raise you from the dead and bring you to the great marriage supper of the Lamb. I have nothing to be afraid of. I can give my life away and not preserve it now and protect it the rest of my days. I don't have to preserve this body, body beautiful. <laughs> I just need to use it for his namesake. That's what this does for me. It sets me free to go love. So let's pray and we're going to go to the table and we're going to remember what Christ has purchased for us on that cross. Father, I thank you the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. Oh, Spirit, make us holy. Change us from the inside. Change our thinking, the mind of the Spirit on eternal things and the things of God. Change our affections. Change the things that we love. Change our wills to walk in the paths of righteousness. Spirit, Transform us. Make us into the image of Christ and let us be those who live in a hope that is so certain. When I look at that empty grave, I see the power of the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And He dwells within me. Oh God, how easy it will be to raise this dead corpse on the last day when the trumpet sounds and I'll be imperishable and immortality. God, let us be done with fear of death. God, let it set every believing heart free here this morning. And God, I pray if there are any in our midst who are still in the flesh, oh God, the only power that can change this is not morality or religion. The only power is looking to this Christ who hung on a cross in our place. And in that, the Spirit will make us alive. And he will dwell in us and he will transform us and he will bring us to glory. And so God, we thank you for this blessed hope and promise that you have given us in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said,